Hi everybody, this is Sharon Hill. This is a presentation entitled Spooky Geology. It's an introduction to the website of the same name and it goes over a number of the concepts that uh, I cover in the website. This opening slide is of Skull Rock in Joshua Tree, California. and It is a bit of an enhanced photo, but generally the stone structure does resemble a skull face and it is kind of spooky to look at something that looks like it's looking back at you. This presentation will kind of be like walking through a carnival sideshow of strange ideas. It's not talking so much about geology, but about people. No matter how complex the geology is, people and their lives and worldview will be even more complicated. But on a very serious note, people really do believe this stuff, not just a few people. The majority of the U.S. population believe in at least one paranormal concept. The number one most popular belief, according to a Chapman University poll of 2017, is Atlantis. Ancient, advanced civilizations such as Atlantis once existed. That's 55%, as you can see on this graphic. Now, I'm not going to talk about Atlantis in this presentation and why it's a complete myth, because this topic and all its aspects are a huge thing to cover and there's plenty of information on the web about it already. But I wanted to give you a variety of things in this presentation, some of which you maybe had never heard about. But I want to start with something so obviously false. But many people, many people, I'm not kidding, subscribe to this idea. The Flat Earth. This slide is an homage to Terry Pratchett's Discworld, which I strongly recommend. If you haven't read it already, you would enjoy it. Now, no one really believes, I think, that the Earth is a disk carried by elephants on top of a turtle flying through space. But there is a growing movement of people who believe, once again, that the Earth is indeed flat and that we've been duped by knowledge authorities all these centuries. It's a very complicated topic. It's uh, also not easy to cover in this type of presentation, and I'm sure I will tackle it at some later date with regards to spooky geology. It's a good one, and it's got many facets to it, so we'll just leave that as another idea. But let's just see how this rather old, antiquated idea has come back to the forefront in 2017. In late September of 2017, a not very popular rapper named B.O.B. came out on social media where he lives, and he was saying that the earth is flat because he can't see the curve. Now, he started a crowdsource funding for a satellite to find the curve that the scientists talk about. And then certain other basketball celebrities and C-listers also came out and said that they potentially believe that the earth is flat as well. Astronauts like Scott Kelly, Buzz Aldrin, and astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson came out against B.O.B. and his rather absurd statement that science is wrong and the Earth is really flat. And the first reaction people feel when about this flat Earth idea is that it's hard to believe people can be this stupid. But if you dig down, not too far, you'll find that this new trend is more about rejection of authority in general and a distrust of what authoritative forces tell you to accept. Of course, it's also a bit of gaining personal attention and feeling superior that you know the truth and others don't. Internet searches for the flat earth rose sharply around 2015. This is partly political. It's partly a bandwagon effect. There's the effect of popular people talking about it, so there's going to be a search for the term, and some people will decide that it's an interesting idea to pursue. The history of flat earth idea is rather fascinating. The exact same hand-wringing we're seeing today and the outrage by scientists also occurred in Victorian England with Alfred Russell Wallace, who was a co-discoverer of the theory of natural selection with Darwin. He fought for years with flat earthers of the time. Their basis back then was on biblical literalism, but also fear of the new way of gaining knowledge, which was science, that might supplant that biblical literalism. Today we see that same reaction towards scientific authority. The facts don't matter. People are not empty vessels that need to be filled up with facts, and then the light bulb will go on. It just doesn't work that way. We need better ways to address the distrust and disregard for science in today's society. Increased science education won't fix it. It's actually a social and political problem. 
There's a community of flat earthers around the country in places like Colorado, Boston, New York, Houston, Philly, Phoenix, Chicago. Yes, they're pretty widespread. They have a rejection of what they called programmed learning. They feel that experience counts foremost. You should be able to see the curve and feel the spin. They think that the planet is like a snow globe, flat with this dome around the top and an icy wall at the edges that would constitute Antarctica. November 9th and 10th of 2017 is the Flat Earth International Conference that's taking place in Raleigh, North Carolina. The conference is sold out. If you take a look at the topics being covered at this conference, it's kind of interesting. They include NASA and space lies and lies of mainstream science. So you can see there's a strong conspiratorial theme to the idea of the flat earth. Now, simply sharing the idea of the flat earth or anything else, either positively that you believe it or negatively that you're making fun of it, makes it more popular. Just by calling attention to it, as these public scientists did, open the idea to more people who have a different concept about how our society works. There is a sub-community of flat earthers who think there are no true forests anymore. They were all destroyed in a cataclysm of some sort a while back. They say you can see the remnants of what used to be great trees by looking at the Devil's Tower in Wyoming. And this strange idea was covered by The Atlantic Magazine, a highly reputable source of American commentary. They noted that the video outlining this absurd idea had... 588,000 views. So just like with the Victorian flat earthers, the proponents claim that mainstream geology will buckle under this new finding because it's the real truth. Now the mainstream and well-supported view of the Devil's Tower is that it's a volcanic remnant. Phonolite porphyry rock with columnar jointing give it this striking look. And the rocks may ring when struck. More about this later. But because it was so striking, it was the location of alien contact in the Close Encounters of the Third Kind movie. And just this past year, the nearby town hosted a meetup of New Age and UFO enthusiasts featuring a UFO parade and talks on mystical energy. Now, the tower was already a sacred place to the natives of North America. The National Park Service closes it at certain times of the year for native ceremonies. Their myth is that the striated feature was caused by the claws of a giant bear who attempted to chase children up the tower that was instantly created by the gods. But now we see it's become a modern spiritualism site that ties into my next topic of earth energies. Strange lights and other oddities have been reported here in the Devil's Tower area. And it's also interesting to note that volcanoes and UFOs are often associated we can see an influx of New Age spiritual beliefs associated with several geologically interesting sites. A major concept at the core of these spooky geology ideas is that of earth energies. One example is earthing, the idea that we need to reconnect our bare skin to the earth to be balanced and to feel good. Earth energy concepts propose that there are these hidden forces in the earth that we have not yet discovered and tapped or that the ancients knew and we moderns have forgotten their importance. It ties into this new age idea that we are one with the earth and the universe. And there is this array of magical ideas marketed about tapping into these occult forces of the earth with our third eyes and psychic senses. So some examples I'm going to talk about include dowsing, ley lines, environmental recording, crystal energy, earth lights, and mysterious sounds. So the first one is dowsing also known as water divining or water witching. It's the use of a forked stick, metal rods, or a pendulum to feel around for an underground substance of some sort. Water is, is very typical. Witching is an American term, and if you're doing it for oil, it's called doodle bugging. Proponents will sometimes try to get us skeptics to try it for ourselves, to be convinced that it works. Now, of course, this is a terrible test. No doubt it's a lot quicker, cheaper, and more decisive than using a well driller, but it's not more accurate. Repeated and controlled tests confirm over and over again that when blinded, 
The results from dousing are not better than chance. And the main reason it works is the ideomotor effect. This is the subtle suggestion that you see around you. You pick up clues, and these cause small unnoticed muscle movements that show up in the highly unstable dousing devices. And this effect has been known since the 17th century. Dowsers still contend that it's a skill, a feel. It's occult knowledge. They don't know exactly how it works, but it just does. Except when it doesn't. And then the proponents make excuses. If you compare two dowsers independently, uh, you'll see they probably don't converge on the same location, unless there are obvious clues. Also, you might want to see if they'll guarantee a dry hole. They probably won't. Important thinkers such as Paracelsus and Agricola were not convinced by dowsing. The practice is not very ancient, but it's conflated with the ancient idea of a magic wand or rod, like you bring forth water with a magic staff. There's only been about 500 years of modern divining. It was brought to England by German miners and spread via colonization. The first use of, of dousing for water was in 1558. It's interesting to hear the strange hydrogeological concepts dowsers have. They assume water flows in underground streams or domes, and that's the special feeling they tap into, the movement of the water. Sometimes they use the word energy or electromagnetic fields to bolster some off-the-cuff explanations of how it might work, but no mechanism for these fields have ever been found. We should be able to detect any energy field with our sensitive instruments that we have today. None are ever located. Dowsing continues to be popular because there are other potent psychological and social reasons for it to still be accepted. There is considerable objective scientific rational literature on the popularity and testing of dowsing that you can find if you're interested. On to another idea about energy from the earth, ley lines. A few years ago, a paranormal investigator who knew I was a geologist asked me about ley lines. He assumed they were real, and so, of course, geologists would know about them. Many sacred sites and location of weird phenomenon are supposedly located on these lines and tap into the power of the planet. It's a hidden network of energy lines across the earth. The concept of ley lines, or lays, was developed in England by archaeologist Alfred Watkins. He wrote Early British Trackways in 1922 and The Old Straight Track in 1925. Watkins saw that places of prehistoric and historic significance were aligned across long distances in the British countryside. Ancient henges, ancient sacred building sites, monuments, tours, holy wells, etc. could be mapped along straight lines regardless of the terrain. Watkins' view was purely utilitarian. It was not supernatural at all. It was a way he thought of navigating across the land from one point to the other. It was a powerful idea, though, that caught on and gained supernatural significance a little bit later on, as if these lines were special energy across the earth. And those that picked up the idea thought maybe the lines came first, before the structures, and that ancient people had special knowledge of these lines of energy, and that's why they placed the structures there. French author Aimé Michel, in Flying Saucers and the Straight Line Mystery of 1958, said that UFO sightings in France had occurred along invisible lines across great distances that formed a grid. He called this idea orthoteny. Ley lines and orthotenic lines were joined in concept by John Mitchell, who wrote The View Over Atlantis in 1969, and that heralded the whole Earth Mysteries concept, and then it just exploded in accordance with New Age ideas of the time. Lays were also thought of as arteries of the earth, sort of like chi lines of energy, as in Chinese pre-scientific medicine things of the human body. And those standing stones, like those of Stonehenge, were akin to acupuncture needles into the earth at these special meridians to harness the energy. Though people can say they feel the ley lines, again, they're never detectable by our instrumentation. At one point, I thought perhaps lineaments and fracture traces, which are known geological features, might have been mistaken as lays. I was not able to find anyone who connected these ideas. But I'm not convinced that no one has put these together. I just probably haven't looked hard enough. In 2003, the ghost hunting community was on to ley lines. Lays were linked with the old ideas of spirit paths, 
straight lines from the church to the graveyard in which the spirit traveled. Alternatively, some thought the energy channeled through the lays were tapped by some entities and that strange activities were associated with them. There's no shortage of sciencey sounding ideas put forward by paranormalists. I call this scientifical, being scientifical. They're attempting to sound like they're talking about actual scientific research, but they're falling far short. In the Ghostbusters 2016 movie, ley lines were at the crux of all the paranormal trouble. This slide shows the intersect of the lays, with inadequate points, I might add, and they decide that the bad guy is using some device to charge the ley lines and create a paranormal vortex that will destroy the city. Areas of powerful energy, often assumed to be where lays cross, make a very special, powerful area of earth energy. If you go to vortexhunter.com, you will see a melange of scientifical and baseless ideas about these fictional features, vortexes. Paranormal vortexes are supposedly portals that act as doorways to the afterlife or other dimensions. They can be places where you feel a sense of pure evil, where bizarre things happen, or you can feel a great sense of well-being. Vortexes are also associated with gravity hills, where it appears you are on the level but cars roll when placed in neutral. These are optical illusions, not special energy of the Earth. There are no measurable criteria for these vortex places, except that people feel weird there, and they have a strange history where odd events are reported. Psychics are overwhelmed at such places, feeling the energy. Possibly the most famous vortex spot occur in Sedona, Arizona. There are multiple mapped vortexes here, often marked, they say, by twisted trees, often juniper trees. And if you walk around Bell Rock, which is what this picture depicts, you will certainly find those twisted trees all over the place. Sedona takes great advantage of this aspect to draw paranormal tourists. When told to feel a powerful energy at a certain spot on the vortex tour, many people imagine they really do feel it. Here is my picture of evidence of a vortex. I captured this right there, completely by accident. I can tell you I felt pretty wonderful when I was there, and I highly recommend a visit. You can have your very own geologically spiritual experience. Of course, whether you think this is a vortex is uh, open for debate. What if the environment can record human emotion? A popular speculation for the cause of haunting is the stone tape idea of environmental recording and playback. Sound and visual representations are recorded into the very rock by trapping the energy of traumatic events for later playback like a tape recording. Only those sensitive to it will receive the playback. This concept was popularized by a TV teleplay in 1972 on the BBC. It featured a very old castle with a stone staircase that was the scene of an apparition jumping to her death and horrible screams that only one woman could hear. The idea of environmental recording is really old. In the 1800s, esteemed scientists of the day expressed their speculation that this actually happened. Today, you'll hear those that subscribe to this idea say that quartz, but sometimes limestone, is the best host rock. Now, ghost hunters will investigate the geology insofar as to look for any traces of these types of rock, and then they'll assume they're there if they can't find any. There is a noteworthy point to be made about Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. This is a mecca of paranormalists. No less than a dozen ghost tours are located here. So much death happened here that people are convinced that some residue of emotion remains. And the rocks are strange and obvious. So the stone tape idea has been invoked, often referring to boulders as granite. Now, these boulders are not made of granite, but of diabase, and that is actually quartz poor. There are no appreciable limestone deposits here either. So the stone tape balloon is easy to puncture. However, most people on the tours and in gross hunting groups only assume and don't actually check the facts behind this so-called theory. The tape idea is also applied to water, where humidity around a stream or water body will record, preserve, and or activate the playback of memories. And rust on nails is also a creative idea invoked to be just like magnetic tape with iron oxide coating so that renovations of a building activates hauntings by exposing the iron oxide dust, and you get this some sort of environmental playback. 
With regards to the mechanisms of the stone tape theory, most often uh, proponents refer to the molecular architecture of quartz, uh, the so-called crystal lattice. They'll also potentially invoke resonant frequencies of atomic vibration, which is often used in paranormal explanations by people who don't really know what frequency even means. Inductive electromagnetic fields, meaning that the Earth's dynamic geomagnetic field, especially acting in conjunction with a local static field. Quantum entanglement, also brought up. When in doubt, the go-to word to impress people is quantum. Be very, very wary. And these environmental recording ideas are a subset of the idea of psychometry. Psychometry means measuring the soul. Initiated by Joseph Rhodes Buchanan, William Denton was a geologist who was one of his followers. Denton's wife and sister were said to be skilled at psychometry. Denton believed they could hold a piece of coal and describe the swampy hot setting where it was formed. He thought that the rocks of the Triassic Basin would psychically reveal the images of the animals who made the footprints imprinted in the rock. But even rocks without fossils could reveal their diagenesis. He wrote in The Soul of Things in 1866 that psychometry would be a revolution in geologic science. No more difficult field work or unanswered questions. Just hold the rock in your hand, and if you had the gift, you could read the memories of the rock. You can see the obvious flaws in this. Denton's ideas were quite logically dented, and he was so in love with this idea that he lost all objectivity. But psychometric readings are still used today by modern psychics who say they can read an object that belonged to someone missing or deceased and provide information about them. We move on to earth lights. They're also called spook lights or ghost lights. These also include claims of phenomenon such as ball lightning and earthquake lights. These unexplained balls of light appear from the earth. The most famous location for these spook lights include Joplin, Missouri, Marfa, Texas, Paulding, Michigan, here is the depiction of the Joplin light. It goes by other names as well. There is a cultural expectation that goes with this light. The folklore story is that they represent ghosts of those who were killed in some tragic way. Many of these lights have that type of story associated with them. So when scientists then study the lights and conclude that it's atmospheric optics at play, those explanations are ignored for the more fun story about the paranormal. Another extremely popular Earth Lights location is the Brown Mountain Lights of North Carolina. First reported in 1913 and still seen today from several locations, usually best during the fall on clear nights. The orbs of light rise up and behave strangely. The lights were examined by the U.S. Geological Survey in 1922 when public interest and an urgent request by the local congressman sent geologist George Mansfield there. He determined they were not paranormal or mysterious, but regular lights of various sorts. But like I noted before, people wanted these lights to be more interesting than that, and the mysterious nature of the lights continued to be pressed. Ball lightning is something that seems to be real. We've heard lots of stories, we assume it's real, but we can't confirm it's real, or how it can be real. It's commonly thought to be plasma resulting from electrically superheated gases, and it's said to move straight through walls or window and sometimes act intelligently. Some UFOs are also described like ball lightning, so much so it's hard to tell the difference. And sometimes re they're reported to be potentially dangerous as they do explode. This phenomenon is genuinely mysterious still. We can't make a conclusion about it with any degree of confidence. Earthquake lights are also extremely controversial. They are described to be sometimes like ball lightning, but coming from the ground, and they travel along a fault before a quake. Or they can be a diffuse glow on the land or in the air. They're not well documented and not explained. Are they related to earth stresses? It's not too far-fetched to think that under some conditions, seismic areas can release aerosols from the ground, or create a charge that ionizes the surrounding air. But it would have to be a very particular situation. Current reports of earthquake lights also include flashes from exploding transformers, which can be a bit confusing. There are also real eerie glows from static buildup, known to sailors as St. Elmo's fire on ship's mast during electrical storms. I think there's still something to look at with regards to earthquake lights and ball lightning, but we really don't know that much about them right now. The Hestalen lights in Norway were examined by university personnel from Norway and Sweden. 
These lights appeared in night or day as orbs that float through or out of the valley, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. They occurred at least since the 1930s and had been recorded. They're not so prevalent now as they were in the 1980s. The researchers thought that they were possibly related to scandium deposits, piezoelectric effects, or some ionizing plasma. Or they're simply an optical effect due to the atmosphere. Michael Persinger, a neuroscientist who studies the effect of magnetic fields on the brain, developed the tectonic strain theory as a physical explanation for strange lights and potential paranormal activity that happens around a faulted area under stress. The data doesn't add up, but because it was an idea by a legitimate scientist, paranormal investigators invoke Persinger's research all the time. Persinger was also the developer of the so-called God Helmet that created a magnetic field in the subject's brain that disrupted the typical electrical signals and resulted in some people having a sense of presence or an out-of-body experience. This has also been used extensively by ghost hunters to justify looking for electromagnetic fields around so-called haunted places. Also, they see what the space weather or state of the geomagnetic field is at the time of paranormal experiences. But the strength of these induced fields isn't comparable to the geomagnetic field at all. Ghost hunters are very confused about electromagnetic fields in general. They can't decide if the ghosts are attracted to them or if the EMFs cause people to hallucinate ghosts, which is sort of at odds with each other. If you ever meet up with a ghost hunter, ask them to explain EMFs and ghosts or what geology has to do with ghosts, and they will flail in the wind talking complete nonsense. Speaking of complete nonsense, do an online search for crystals and you will be barraged with advertisements for magical crystals that calm, cure, and protect you from anything and everything. Crystal vendors are popular at psychic fairs and paranormal events. Ask one crystal vendor what amethyst or rose quartz is good for and then go ask the next one and they will give you a different answer or something just as vague as to be essentially meaningless. There's so much nonsense about crystals, mostly quartz variety, but also lapis, tourmaline, turquoise, selenite, and even salt. Himalayan pink salt is like super special because of the wonderful ions that are released that make you feel great. These ideas about the magical nature of crystals are very old, some 6,000 years or so. But today you will hear these claims interspersed with sciencey words like atomic structure, crystal lattice, and piezoelectricity to make it sound like the healing power is scientifically justified. Now quartz does have some neat properties like its piezoelectric nature that make it useful in microchips and watches among other things, and it makes sparks in the dark. These real properties of quartz crystals are currently being exploited by the owners of the Board Camp Crystal Mine in Wachita Mountains in Arkansas. The owners claim all sorts of extraordinary things are happening there on a regular basis. There are tons of lights, floating orbs, levitating and moving rocks, mysterious magnetization of poles in the ground. I wrote up this site on spookygeology.com if you want to see the details. And I also contacted the Arkansas Geological Survey. And one staff member also interested in this spooky stuff helped me dig through these claims. We pretty much determined that appeared that they were hoaxing these trail camera photos of mists and floating rocks and lights, along with adding some natural theatrics of smashing quartz crystals and producing triboluminescence for visitors. It's a nice gimmick to bring people to your site instead of the other dozen nearby crystal mines, they now market the place as mysterious. It was recently featured on a Travel Channel show as a UFO hotspot, and the owners think that maybe the extraterrestrial vehicles visit their mine to recharge on crystal energy. Recently, a Miami-area congressional candidate, Bettina Aguilera, says she was abducted by aliens, and she reported that their ship was powered by quartz crystals. I like to focus on one particular crystal myth, that of the fairy stones, because it's a really cool story. Starlight has a common twinning habit of 90 or 60 degree angles forming a cross. They're made into jewelry and good luck charms. There are an abundance of starlight crystals at the Fairy Stone State Park in Virginia. The story of the park is that fairies lived there 2,000 years ago. One day, elves came to relay the message of Jesus' crucifixion. The fairy tears formed these crosses. The crystals are sold as being able to protect the owner from illness, curses, and accidents. A common legend is that Richard the Lionhearted used the stone to cure his malaria. 
The crystals are magical in that they can not only help you stop smoking, but contain energy, calming fear and stress. Many Storolite objects sold today are not the genuine stone at all, but manufactured. On to mysterious sounds. Many kinds of mysterious sounds seem to emanate from the earth. The world is a noisy place these days, so such reports are nearly constant. Sounds are particularly hard to pinpoint and investigate because of the distances that can be traveled and atmospheric conditions that can distort it. Even buildings around can result in echoes. The most common mystery sound today are booms. Some booms are eventually attributed to fireworks or other explosives like tannerite. Sonic booms from military aircraft or exploding meteors. It's rare, but it happens. Remember the Chelyabinsk fireball? That was in 2013, and it produced a very big shockwave that caused a lot of damage. From early times, before big cannons existed, there were reports of guns, very loud booming noises, especially near water. And they have a name, brontides. Notable examples of brontides are the Barisol guns in Bangladesh, Seneca guns of New York, the Mispuffers of Belgium and France, and the Yuminari of Japan. Many of these cases are documented in scientific literature. We just aren't sure of the mechanism by which they occur. Localized historic booming noises can also be associated with shallow seismic activity or microquakes. The quakes are not strong, maybe even not noticeable, but seem to produce audible sound. These occur regularly in Moodus, Connecticut, originally called by the natives Mackimudis, place of bad noises. The booms were attributed to bad spirits, and it made the Puritans nervous. These earthquake-related booming sounds were also heard in Spokane, Charleston, South Carolina, even Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. From the summer of 2011, there were a growing number of reports of various strange sky noises that became known worldwide via social media. This was just prior to the Mayan apocalypse of December 2012, so people were on edge and ideas about the end of the world were popular. The noises included hums, loud metallic sounds, and almost musical tones. There were so many incidents of what people called the trumpets of the apocalypse on YouTube that new websites existed just to track them. Many of these cases were hoaxes. Some were stuck train brakes or industrial equipment malfunctioning. But certain corners of the internet promoted much weirder ideas about them. The magnetic poles were shifting. They were acoustic gravity waves. The earth was groaning, or it was HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, being used as mind control. Of course, it could also be because of fracking or aliens. Annoying hums have been around for decades in Windsor, Ontario, Calgary, Alberta, and Taos, New Mexico. It's not clear what causes it, but annoying sounds at low frequencies can be caused by wind through structures and even animals like schools of fish and giraffes in the zoo. To people who experience these unexpected sounds, they are very real and scary because they don't know where they're coming from and if it's a threat. When scientists brush off their concerns, people turn to alternative sources who are more often misinformed or present mistaken information and nonsense. Mystery mongering websites abound to promote these ideas. Moving on to anomalies that are kind of odd, standard fare for 70s mystery media were the moving rocks of racetrack playa or the Death Valley sailing stones. Hundreds of rocks, not all small, leave tracks of movement in the dry lake bed. Speculation as to their cause included magnetic forces, aliens, again, psychic energy, vortices, there's those vortices again, or pranksters. In 2002, science writer Brian Dudding noted that when there was water in the lake, ice sheets formed overnight. And if there was no ice, a strong wind present in the early morning would move the entire lake in one direction at a rate of about a half mile per hour. And he captured this on film, but saw no rocks moving. It seemed plausible that this could be related to the mechanism. And he was ready to test this idea by setting up equipment in the winter of 2014 and 15, when other scientists beat him to it and confirmed the hypothesis that the moving broken ice sheets were capable of pushing the rocks with the wind, and they leave a trail along the bottom. And this was published in PLOS One Journal. Racetrack Playa is hard to access, but you can see the same activity at work at Bonnie Claire Playa, which is more easily accessible. Some people didn't get the memo that it was solved and still consider it a mysterious place. 
Internal stresses cause rocks to break apart or burn on their own. Rock bursts in mines have killed miners in modern South African deep mines. The excavated rock attains equilibrium with the lower pressure and then releases. Exfoliation has been observed in real time in granite slabs like these near a dam in California. Heated by the sun and then contracting at night, the rock slabs pop suddenly and let loose or fly apart. It's a very rapid weathering agent, quite dramatic and noisy. Heating rocks in a fireplace or a bonfire can also cause explosions due to these internal stresses. A bizarre and scary situation occurred in 2012 in Southern California when a woman collected a funny-looking beach rock and put it in her pocket. By the time she walked home and it had dried out more, it spontaneously combusted and burned her. Later, it was determined that the rock was coated with a phosphorus substance. That's used in munitions, fireworks, and fertilizer. Phosphorus can readily combust when dry and exposed to air. The substance coating these rocks was almost certainly man-made, Authorities did not find rocks in the area of a similar nature, and there was no further word on what had happened. In Menominee, Michigan, there was a boom from the forest. Upon inspection, the ground was vertically displaced in a pretty extraordinary way. Tree roots were broken and the soil had heaved. Geologists determined that the limestone bedrock surface fractured and warped upwards suddenly due to equilibrium of these internal stresses. Internal stresses also appear to be responsible for why some rocks ring like a bell when struck. Also called lithophonic rocks, the most obvious location for these is Ringing Rocks Park in Upper Black Eddy, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And there are several other places in PA where this type of diabase results in ringing rocks. Many are in these boulder fields called Felsenmeer, meaning a sea of rock. It seems kind of magical why some ring and others don't, and it's not altogether explained, but it's not unexplainable. Certain kinds of silica sand dunes under certain humidity conditions will produce a sound when pressure is applied by walking or sliding. They whistle or bark or squeak. Sand dunes can also roar or boom. Also not completely understood, it appears to be that friction between the grains or compression of airspace causes this natural phenomenon. Many beaches, even Great Lakes sand beaches, exhibit this weird anomaly. Concretions. My archaeology friends hate them. They can really look bizarre, and their unnatural look is responsible for them being labeled as alien artifacts, fossil eggs or skulls, giants, bones, or meteorites. In the bottom right of this slide is one of the Klerksdorf spheres. They may be the most famous concretions of all. All sorts of bizarre speculation exists about their origin. Their geological origin isn't one of the topics usually brought up. Time to visit some weird places, places of so-called high strangeness, known for many and various paranormal events occurring in one location. Such places are often said to be associated with magnetic anomalies or unique rock types, none of which end up being all that unique. If there are gravity or magnetic anomalies, they are well known and aren't scientifically associated with any perceptual problems. Loch Ness is the location of not just a monster, but of a place of dark magic and ancient pagan lore. Satanist Alistair Crowley gave up on trying to tap into this dark magic at his prior home there. Crowley allegedly made the Loch Ness monster when he failed to complete a complex magic ritual at Boleskine House. The monster has also been attributed to the natural seiches occurring in the lake. Also, the tectonic strain theory is brought up here because of the Great Glen Fault that was involved in the origin of the lake. The Bermuda Triangle is a vortex, of course. The area between Florida and Bermuda is legendary for strange disappearances. These missing planes and boats are also attributed to magnetic anomalies and methane bubble explosions from the ocean floor, but these have no basis in fact. In fact, the exaggerated number of disappearances also have no basis. There really is nothing anomalous about the Bermuda Triangle area, but the pseudo-natural explanations invoked are kind of interesting. Chestnut Ridge in Indiana, Westmoreland, and Fayette County, Pennsylvania, and into West Virginia, is a hotspot of paranormal activity. It's thought by some to be a portal area. In 1972-1973, there was the world's most concentrated sighting of UFO and weird creatures reported in the shortest span of time. It's the location of the Kecksburg UFO incident and many Bigfoot claims and other unexplainable incidents. Researcher Stan Gordon in Greensburg, PA, has been investigating such reports for almost 50 years. 
And there's a documentary out now by an independent filmmaker called Invasion of Chestnut Ridge, where locals recount the insane events that went on there. Let's go to hell, shall we? Several places around the world are considered as possible gates to hell, both literally and figuratively. The most obvious place of hell is Hekla in Iceland. But I just recently started looking into the story of Castle Huska in the Czech Republic that was supposedly built over a bottomless pit that was an entrance to hell where flying creatures and demons escaped. But that story is for another day. This is the Darvasa crater in the Karakum Desert of Turkmenistan. It's 230 feet wide, 66 feet deep, and it's a hole on fire fed by a natural gas stream. It's like a gigantic gas fireplace releasing massive heat and dangerous fumes. Its formation is unclear, but Soviet geologists came into this area in the 1950s looking for oil and gas reserves. Some years later, they accidentally opened this door to hell when a drill rig collapsed, exposing the crater. Methane was being released, so they decided to burn it off, and it's been burning ever since. In 2013, National Geographic sponsored researcher George Coronis to enter the pit in a Kevlar suit and take samples, and the samples revealed interesting bacteria not found in the surrounding soil. Efforts to quench the fire have been put off, presumably due to the high costs and the low odds of working, but also it's now a tourist attraction. Just don't camp too close to the flames. In the village of Batagai in Nikutia area of Siberia, there is a site that has gained the name Hellmouth. It's a giant subsidence. It's now one kilometer long and 86 meters deep, and it keeps growing, threatening the livelihood of the local villagers. It's a mass-wasting mega slump that resulted from the melting of the permafrost. Harvesting of timber decades ago allowed the soil to be exposed to the sun and warm enough to melt the ice, causing the slumping. Now, this is a self-feeding process. It can't be stopped, so it gets bigger all the time. The Yakut people, who still seek advice from their shamans, had some superstitious beliefs about the sound and destruction coming from the site. It's not a gate to hell, but a gate to the past, as researchers can study 200,000-year-old soil in its walls. Off to the Mediterranean region, where in ancient history several entrances to hell were proposed to exist. Necromantion were places where you can converse with the dead. The most famous were Ephira in Greece and the Plutonion in the Heropolis in Turkey, where you will die from the nox- noxious gases emitted from it. It's the underworld, you know. It isn't pleasant. The most famous smoky magical place in this area was the Oracle of Delphi, where Pythia, the priestess of Apollo, would channel messages from the gods, answer questions of great import, and provide prophecies to very important people. A chasm at Delphi was said to be the navel or center of the earth. The story of its discovery is that a shepherd and his goats went mad upon encountering the fisher. He began ranting mystical pronouncements. Others came to have a look, and some fell into the chasm, so it was secured. A temple was built there, and a permanent reader of the oracle was installed, though not year-round. Long ago, historians suspected there were gases rising from the fissure that caused hallucinations experienced by the priestess. But no evidence of a crack or gases were found. Until 2001, when scientists pieced together ancient history and modern chemical analysis. The faults here were capable of transmitting gases, the so-called mephitic vapors. After testing the water, the researchers found hydrocarbons, particularly ethylene, which can make you high if you breathe it and they sourced it to a bituminous limestone. The vapors have diminished over the centuries, and now only a trace is left. It could be that various earthquakes have cut off the gas emissions to the location. Another oracle has been discovered at Baie in Italy, west of Naples, along the Bay of Puzzoli. This one's even more controversial. Baie, or Bayi, was an ancient resort city. It was the Las Vegas of its day. It was a popular vacation place, that is, until seismic activity caused most of it to sink underwater rapidly. This location is part of Campania, a volcanic complex that includes the Phlegrian Fields to the north and Mount Vesuvius. Dr. Robert Paget discovered a tunnel complex there in the 1960s and concluded that it was also a necromantion. The tunnels are carved through the deposits of a past Plinian eruption, so they aren't hard to excavate. 
Upon entering the gate with your gifts and animal sacrifices back in the day, the trip would simulate a descent into Hades, most likely complete with theatrics and use of secret chambers by the priests. The most interesting thing about this tunnel was at the end you reached a river six foot wide and two feet deep in the dark. Did it simulate the sticks? Some suspect the participants got into a small boat and paid the ferryman to take you across. The water is potable and a dye trace didn't show a surface outlet, so it's unclear how the tunnel builders were able to pinpoint its location so precisely. The tunnel has been mapped, but not studied extensively, so these mysteries remain. If you can't get to Greece or Italy, you can head to Trout Run Road in York, Pennsylvania, where there are supposedly seven gates, and if you pass through them all, you reach hell. It's on private land, so you're more likely to get arrested before you reach the seventh gate, but it's a popular legend tripping spot. It's got nothing to do with geology, sorry. Out-of-place artifacts are also known as uparts. These are of interest to archaeologists, but they often have a decidedly geologic explanation. I've had people swear to me that these are ancient wheels or gears in the rock, where any geologist or naturalist knows exactly what they are, but that hardly matters when one could concoct a better story. They are, in fact, crinoid stem pieces. Mr. and Mrs. Hahn found this piece at Red Creek in London, Texas, in 1934 or 36. The nodule was opened several years later to reveal the hammerhead of 19th century origin. It's now in a creationist museum as proof of Noah's flood. The item is suspicious. It was not found in situ. There is poor documentation of the finding, and there's no matching host rock. It looks like it fell into a low spot where the natural concretion formed in a very short time. It's not supernatural. There is also no shortage of stories of animals entombed in stone or metal pieces embedded in rocks. These are often broken drill bits. Such anomalies, or uparts, are explainable and don't come close to overturning geologic time scale or history. Creationists often make hay of simulacra that they think will undo all of science. The Paluxy dinosaur tracks in nearby Glen Rose, Texas are a big deal. So is the idea of finding a living dinosaur based on native stories in Africa, people actually spend money to look for this. Even finding Bigfoot or some unknown mystery animal is thought to be a way to prove science wrong, which will, they surmise, overturn all knowledge and show the Bible is the true science textbook. The end. No, really. Many people think this is the start of the end times, a new age of catastrophism. This belief often has a basis in religion, but also a great fear that the world is just going to hell. Common heralds of the end of the world include giant earthquakes, sinkholes and collapses, tsunamis and storms, flooding, volcanic eruptions, poles shifting. People are terrified that we can be sucked in, swept away, or covered over, engulfed by our own planet that provides us life. It's a primal fear, and we can't escape from that kind of destruction. I've already talked about the booms and trumpets of the apocalypse. Those were very popular stories, and those reports were contagious. And they also come around in a cycle every so often. It was real end times for some 1,800 people and countless livestock who died at Lake Nyos in Cameroon in August of 1986. The lake suddenly degassed, and a plume of carbon dioxide suffocated the nearby village in what's called a limnic eruption. The 600-foot-deep volcanic lake suddenly ejected the gas fountain like a soda bottle. The lower layer of water supersaturated with gas, was unstable. Some disturbance, maybe a small quake or eruption of lava or rock slide, triggered the release. The folklore of the area had suggested the waters of the lake periodically misbehaved. Indeed, they did. The lake is now mechanically degassed, so this hopefully will not reoccur. Giant cracks in the Earth's surface appear unrelated to quakes. Soil fissures are notable in central Arizona where the geologic survey there has a hotline you can call and a means of tracking their spread. They can be meters across and tens of feet deep and miles long. The overwithdrawal of groundwater causes compaction and subsidence of the soil. And these cracks have been tracked since the late 70s. But they were not new. Such phenomenon has been noted since wells have been used for irrigation in the American West. This is Hermosillo, Mexico in 2014. This apocalyptic crack was tracked by a drone and made into a video that was super popular on YouTube. Of course, the explanation for the crack was not part of the video. 
so people thought the worst. These worrisome natural incidents are considered signs of the end by some. Much is made out of them by internet sites like the Daily Mail in the UK, Sign of the Times, which is Sot.net, and Coast to Coast AM, and these places promote this scary and paranormal narrative. The stories are exaggerated and taken out of context and put into their own end times context. It can freak the audience out if they don't know any better. Plenty of end of the world predictions pass without incident, but people don't remember that. They seem to get worried every time another one comes up. It's up to the more rational voices to come out and tell the geologic story and why that's important for people to hear. So that's all I can squeeze into this talk. As you can see, there are abundant fun facts to discuss with people who like bizarre stories about how the earth works, and many mysteries remain. There are tons more anomalies and weird natural phenomena that I didn't get into that are just as astounding. And I'll be adding more to my website if you'd like to visit spookygeology.com. Please tell your friends or teachers or kids about the site and show them that geology isn't so uptight and boring, but it can be mysterious fun too.